Good morning, everyone. If you'll grab your hymn books, please, and turn to number 92. We'll sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Number 92, we'll sing all four stanzas together. And for those of you that don't know, I, let's, I'd like to be one of the first to wish our pastor a very happy birthday. Happy birthday, pastor. And if you found number 92, let's stand together, please, and sing it together. turn for our reading, please, to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. While you're turning, let me remind you that next Sunday will be one meeting only at 11 o'clock. So no 10 o'clock meeting and no live streaming next week. You're going to hear a message, the Lord willing, that I preached a little over two years ago from John 3.16 concerning the love of God what the Lord is speaking of in that verse. And Brother Randy will lead us in reading, and of course Rich will lead in the worship. So one meeting next week at 11 o'clock. I'm going to refer back to this passage, but I want you to look with me in Revelation, the second chapter. This is our Lord speaking to John. This is about... Uh, 94, 95 A.D., so our Lord in his resurrected and ascended state now speaks back through John to the church at Ephesus. So chapter 2 and verse 1, unto the angel, that's the messenger of the pastor, of the church in Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, that's the Lord Jesus, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. This is the perfect age of the church. Here's what he said to the church at Ephesus. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars, 
and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father, as an assembly, we approach your throne today as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the all and the total of our salvation. We bring our praises and our petitions. We pray for those who are not with us. Some are traveling, some are working, and some are ill. And We pray for each one. And we thank you for this day that you've given us to worship. Would you bless us, please, as we sing? Bless our hearts to receive thy goodness and thy mercy. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we approach your throne. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. If you'll grab your hymn books once again, please, and turn to number 526, The Solid Rock. Number 526, we'll sing all four stanzas together. So if you found 526, please stand with me and let's sing it together. the sun. 
Would you please take your Bibles and turn with me to the letter of 2 Timothy. I'm so glad you're here today. I pray the richest blessings of our Lord upon you. We're glad for all who have joined us by our live streaming. And I hope that the Lord will bless you in your homes or as you're traveling. God's word to our hearts. I think we have in many ways a passage before us that is a contrast of great happiness and also great sorrow. So I want you to look with me. We're in the first chapter. We're going to finish this chapter today. I want us to start in verse number 15. Paul writing to Timothy, and he said, This thou knowest. I don't really need to remind you, you already know this. Here's the sad part that all they which are in Asia be or are turned away from me, of whom are thy jealous and her mogenies. Then here's the happy part. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesphorus, for he oft refreshed me, was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy in the Lord in that day. Means at the end of time, when Christ comes, the end of the age. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Paul came preaching what he called grace, salvation by grace. He meant this message to be very humbling, to take away all all credit from man and give all credit to God in the salvation of any sinner. He said this grace means that God condemned in a representative and he justified in a representative. The one man by his disobedience And the other man, the last man, by his obedience. God saw a seed in the first man and he saw a seed in the last man. And by the simple virtue of the work of that last man, God forgave and he reconciled and he justified his chosen people for himself. Some are Jews, he said, and some are Gentiles. Since it's by grace, no works, no credit of man, then it's equally true for Gentiles as it is for Jews. It's equally true for women as it is for men. It's equally true for those who are slaves and those who are free. He said, that's grace. And he said, God gives us faith to see and know that in our hearts. Well, this message was revolutionary. It was absolutely revolutionary. And there were only a few who adhered to it. And there were even fewer who held to it after they heard it. Conversion is turning toward Christ. Apostasy is turning away from Christ. Before us is a story of apostasy. This is the third time Paul has spoken of this apostasy in the pastoral letters. He spoke of it in the first chapter of 1 Timothy, of the third chapter of Titus, And now here at the conclusion of the first chapter of his letter that we call 2 Timothy. 
Someone has said that church history is the history of apostasy. Sadly, I must say, that probably is just about the truth. But I want to talk with you this morning about two things. I want to talk with you about those who remain true. And then by the text, I must talk with you about those who turned away. So let's spend a few minutes talking about those who remain true. I want you to look back with me in the book of Acts. And I'm not trying to be complete, but I just want to talk with you about a few people. Uh, I enjoy this myself. I hope you do. But I like to think about the people who were here. There are names that are mentioned. But then I always think of the many names that are not mentioned. Because in every one of these congregations, there would be a congregation of people that Paul would have known. But their names are not mentioned. There would have been a, a Ken Williams. There would have been a Ken Brown. There would have been a Paul Beebe. There would have been a Jim Bentley. There would have been a Randy Hartwig. There would have been folks like each of you that wouldn't be named. There would have been pastors like myself that wouldn't be named. And yet we know something about some of them. So I like to think about those that we know a little about. One man that we know something about is a man by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas is a name that maybe we don't think much of Barnabas, but his name is mentioned 28 times in the New Testament. For example, look what it says here in Acts chapter 9. This is right after the conversion of the Apostle Paul. And it tells us in the ninth chapter in verse 26 that He's still calling him Saul, not calling him Paul here yet. When Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed or went over and wanted to join himself to the disciples. They pulled away from him. They were afraid of him. And they didn't believe he was a disciple. But look in verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the disciples and declared unto them how that he had seen the Lord in the way. And then if you look over in chapter 11, we see Barnabas again in this chapter. Now, by the time we come to this chapter, actually 14 years have passed. Just a couple of chapters for us, so it doesn't seem like very much. But 14 years have passed, and Saul has gone back up to his home up in Tarsus. No doubt he's preaching up there. But Barnabas is down in Jerusalem, and so he goes up to Tarsus, and in verse 25 it said, chapter 11, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, which would have been up on the north, not all the way to Jerusalem, but up on the north and uh, western side of the promised land, up not too far from Tarsus, really. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and they taught many people. So there is Saul now preaching this gospel of God's grace conditioned upon Christ and Him alone. Then I want you to go with me. Well, look in verse 30. Uh, in verse 29, there is some help that is being gathered for the believers. And notice how it mentions at the end of this chapter, Barnabas and Saul. So now Barnabas and Saul have become companions. They've become friends in the gospel. Then turn with me over to the 13th chapter. Well, at the end of the 12th chapter, tells us that the word of God grew and multiplied in verse 24. And Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem. So they went on down from Antioch down to Jerusalem. Maybe they had been there before. I'm not positive, but it doesn't tell us. But they went back to Jerusalem. And when they had fulfilled their ministry, they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. His family name was, was John. And there were in the church that was Antioch certain prophets and teachers, names them, 
In verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And so Barnabas is, is with him. Then if you'll turn with me over to the 15th chapter. This is after the first Jerusalem, after the first preaching tour. And then you're going to have the uh, Jerusalem council in which they're going to gather together. It tells us in verse 2, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go up to Jerusalem. So they're arguing with those who had come up from Judea in verse 1. This would have been the Jews. And what are they arguing over? They're arguing over grace. They're arguing over salvation conditioned upon Christ alone, upon righteousness earned, righteousness imputed for salvation. So that's a little bit about Barnabas. He's a very important figure all the way, uh, not all the way to the end, but he's mentioned at the very end that Paul writes in 2 Timothy. But then there's also a man by the name of Silas. And so if you'll look with me here in the 15th chapter, you're still there. If you'll look in verse number 2, he probably is one of those who is mentioned and certain other of them. He's probably one of those that is being mentioned. But then if you'll look down to verse 22, then uh, pleased at the apostles and elders, this is after the meeting they've had, and uh, they've established that God's salvation is by grace alone. For example, verse 11, we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus, we shall be saved even as they. So this is his message of grace. Then it pleased the apostles and the elders, I'm in verse 22, with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So Silas is the chief man among them. And through this, uh, through this entire passage of the 18th chapter, through the 18th chapter, he's important. Probably the main thing we know Silas for is in the 16th chapter where it says that Paul and Silas are in jail. And in verse 25 of chapter 16, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. We also know that he was a Roman citizen because after or about the time they're going to be released, Paul said unto them in verse 37, so 1637, Then they have beaten us openly and condemned, being Romans. So he's talking about he and Silas being Romans. So he's a Gentile, a Roman citizen, and uh, very, very important, this matter of truth about Silas. So that's Paul and that's Silas and then I've spoken of Barnabas. Then there are two other men that I would refer to, for example, Luke and Titus. We have some reason to think that they may have been brothers. They probably also are a part of that, that certain number of them that went up to the Jerusalem Council in the 15, 15 and verse 2. But if you'll look with me in the 16th chapter, I want you to see something. It tells us, so this is before the uh, midnight experience in the prison. This is Luke who is doing the writing. He's the writer. And it tells us here in verse 7, notice the pronoun they. It says, after they were come to Mysia. So this is Luke writing and he's speaking of them as if he were not there. But if you'll look just down four verses the pronoun changes from they to we. See it in verse 11? Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course. So who is he speaking of when he speaks of we? Well, he, he's speaking, of course, of himself being with him. He's talking about Timothy is there and Paul is there. And most likely he's talking about Titus because Titus is going to be later in this chapter. 
And so Titus is a highly important figure, most likely the brother of Luke. And he's not mentioned for several years, but he's mentioned eight times in the letter of 2 Corinthians. So he is an important figure through this time. No doubt Paul has put him in various places to preach the gospel. So you have Luke and you have Titus. And Luke, I could say much about him. But Luke, of course, is the writer of the gospel we call Luke. And he's the writer of the book that we call Acts. He's a physician and travels around with Paul, no doubt, to help him. In the 16th chapter, then, we come across a very important man by the name of Timothy. They came to Derby and to Lystra, and there was a certain di- disciple there named Timotheus. So he talks about Timothy, and we could talk a long time about Timothy. We've preached through one book of Timothy. Now we're preaching through the other book. And if we're going to pick out one figure that would have been maybe more important to Paul than anyone else, probably it would have been Timothy. That's what I would think. But also in this 16th chapter, we come across a lady, and her name is Lydia. Tells us in verse 14, and there was a certain a woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. purple. And uh, so she's out there selling, making her living, but she's also worshiping. And it tells us in the middle of verse 14, whose heart the Lord opened. You can't open your own heart. People, as preachers say, open your heart to Jesus. You can't do that. God has to open your heart. He did it for Lydia. He does it in the light of the preaching of the gospel. Now, she becomes important because she and the other women who are with her, no doubt there are men who are associated, but these women and these men become the foundation for the congregation in Philippi. And it's the con- this congregation that so strongly supported Paul. It's either from Philippi that he wrote the letter of Romans or finished the letter of Romans, but it's most likely from there that his letter is carried up to, up to Rome, to that congregation. So Lydia and the congregation in Philippi become very important. But let me to show you a couple of more. Go with me over to chapter 18. You have a husband and a wife. In chapter 18, you come to Athens and Corinth. It tells us in verse 1 and in verse 2, He found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, which would be Rome, with his wife Priscilla. So there were numerous husbands and wives, and Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned among them. They're also going to be mentioned in the 16th chapter of Romans, also at the very end of 2 Timothy. So Aquila and Priscilla were highly important believers. Names listed at the end of 2 Timothy, which I won't go and look at, illustrate those who remain true to the gospel. You also have the man that we've spoken of by the name of Titus. And Titus, of course, Paul wrote the book that we call Titus to him. He was left on the island of Crete to preach the gospel there. He was a spiritual son of Paul, and Paul refers to him in the letter of Philippians as a true yoke fellow. So all the way through, he remained true. Then there are pastors that are mentioned. For example, in Philippians, there is a pastor mentioned by the name of Archippus. And then there is one mentioned in Colossians by the name Epaphras. And then there are believing women by the name of Lydia. In Philippians, there is a lady who is mentioned by the name of or Aphia, I'm not sure how you would pronounce it, and she may have been the wife of Philemon, or she may have simply been a lady in the congregation. There's also a lady by the name of Phoebe, who carried the letter of Romans up to the congregation in Rome from Philippi, very important, and the other women who are mentioned, so both men and women Pastors and pastors' wives. Peter's wife traveled around with him as he preached. Paul had a nephew who is referred to in Acts 23 and verse 16. 
You also have, uh, if you'll look with me to 1 Timothy, look in the first chapter. You have the house if in verse 16. Um, he Verse 16, he refers to, um, I'm sorry, I wanted, I wanted 2 Timothy. I didn't think that sounded right. 2 Timothy to our text. You have the house of Onesphorus. So he and his house, so his wife, probably some older children had become believers. They believed the gospel and they were holding on to the gospel and believed in the face of many, many uh, struggling things that they were up against. And it tells us that he was of the congregation in Ephesus. See it down there in verse 18? He was of the congregation in Ephesus. Ephesus would have been in Asia Minor. He would have been a man who was, uh, no doubt, came to know Christ through the preaching of Paul when he was there, which is referred to in Acts chapter 19. Paul remained there for two years preaching the gospel to them. He would have been a helper to Paul all the way through. You'll also notice that he came to Rome and found Paul. He also would have been there with Paul in Acts 20 at the end of that passage. Remember where Paul meets with the brethren and they fell upon his neck and wept. No doubt Onesiphorus was there. And it tells us here in verse 16 that he refreshed me. That means he cooled me down. Paul was under a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. He cooled me down and stayed with me. This word is used one more time in the book of Philemon in the first chapter in verse 7. This word refreshed means you relieved him and stood with him. But I use this reference to Ephesus to talk about this church for just a moment because we know a lot about this congregation. We know it's beginning in Acts 10, Acts 16. We know their fervor from what is said in Acts 20. We know their truthfulness because the letter of, F, of the Ephesians was written to them. But this would have been about 60, we'll say 60 A.D. But by the time you come to the end of the century, what's happened? We read it a little while ago. The Lord speaks to that congregation. It says they've left their first love. Connie and I travel back to, uh, to see the church building where we had been when I was in seminary in seminary, back in the 70s, so a long time ago now, 40 years ago. And on the building, they had a list of names of people to call if you needed something. We didn't recognize one name. All the names have gone. We went out into the cemetery that was by there, by the church building. We found the names of most of the people, the older people, had passed from that time. Of course, in 40 years, you would expect that. Uh, a congregation is one thing at one time, but what it's going to be down the road, we don't know what it's, what's going to take place. So here is Onesiphorus. He's a part of this congregation in Ephesus, and he's strong, and Paul is commending him. But then this congregation is among those who turned away. This is among those that would have eventually, as he said in verse 15, turned away. So I need to talk with you for just a few minutes about the turning away. This word means exactly the opposite of conversion. Conversion means to turn to, and this word, obstrepho, means to turn away, to turn away. And Paul is going to use this later in the last chapter also, turn away. Paul referred to them with the use of another word that we call apostasy or apostates, and it means to depart. He uses different names to, to uh, describe them. Several in 2 Corinthians 11, he calls them false apostles and deceitful workers. He says they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. They call themselves the apostles of Christ that they were not. He compared them, them to Satan who transformed himself into an angel of light. In verse 15 of the 11th chapter, he said they transformed themselves as the ministers of righteousness. In other words, they said they were like the preachers of righteousness such as 
Noah or as John the Baptist or of Paul. They said they preached righteousness, but they didn't. They preached righteousness in some way conditioned upon works or something the sinner did. We don't know exactly everything they were saying. He also called them messengers of Satan. He also said that they held to another Jesus, another Holy Spirit, and another gospel. In Galatians 1, he refers to another gospel, he said, which is not another. He said they would pervert the gospel. There's only one gospel. It doesn't matter what, whether it's the first century or the 21st century. There's only one gospel. Only one gospel, whether you're in New York or you're in Little Claxton, Tennessee. It doesn't matter. There's just one gospel. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what your tradition is, where you're from, rich or poor. There is just one gospel. So he said, another gospel. He said, which is not another. There is no other. There is a perverted gospel and there is the gospel. And he said in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, some shall depart from the faith. That's the word apostasy. Paul faced many things. He faced dissension, for example, from John Mark who turned and went back from him. Some say they departed because of homesickness or immaturity, but that's not so. He departed because when Paul was clearly declaring this gospel of sin put away by the body and the soul of Jesus Christ, justification conditioned upon Christ alone, God saving his people, at the cross, by the blood of Christ, that righteousness that Christ earned. He said, I can't take it. And he turned and he went back home. Now in time, he will adhere to the gospel, but at that point, it was more than he could take. He wanted in some way to attach some conditions of law and works to it. He faced dissension within. He also faced persecution without. I won't take time to read it, but in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul gives a long list of many things that he suffered from without. He also faced immorality within the congregation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it refers to an incident of immorality which he says is commonly reported among you. That means that it was something that all of them knew and all of them had taken lightly. And he said... Uh, I can't abide this. And so his spiritual conscience must have been bothered greatly by this immorality within the congregation and he took steps to alleviate this. I don't think this is the only time that he faced it. It's the one time that it's publicly known. But he faced dissension within and persecution without and he faced immorality. He also faced murmuring. For example, in 2 Corinthians 12, he refers to debates and envyings and wraths and strifes and backbitings and whisperings and swellings and tumults. A congregation cannot abide with someone who's going to be any one of those things. It just can't do it. And yet Paul faced that. He also faced hypocrisy. You remember that with Peter, he referred to his dissimulation. Quickly, I describe it. Timothy came, or rather not Timothy, but Peter. Peter came up from Jerusalem up to Antioch and he had been preaching and teaching and eating with the Gentiles for several months, having a wonderful time. And then you have Jews that come up and so he separated from them, acting like he had no fellowship with them. And Paul said, this is, this is hypocrisy, it's dissimulation. No doubt Peter repented and he recovered from this and their relationship became solid. I don't know if I would say they were friends or not, but Peter refers to Paul in his letter of 2 Peter chapter 3. He refers to the writing of Paul. I won't take time to read it, but he's no doubt referring to something he put in Romans, and he probably is referring to his writing or something to him connected with Hebrews. If not, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. But he refers to Paul in a very positive way. He faced fables, genealogies, and questions. He faced legalism. He faced rebellion. I like it in, for, in Titus where it refers to liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. He faced cowardice. Demas, he said, loved this present world. 
which means that he refused to accompany Paul to Rome because he knew that Paul was, was headed for trouble. He knew that persecution, heavy persecution, was just around the corner, and his present life meant more to him than anything else. And so he faced cowardice. And then, of course, he faced abandonment because you have this abandonment in this passage. You have abandonment mentioned in uh, Second and First Timothy as well. And so you think Paul had it easy? He had a rough time. Rough time. So smart, so spiritual, so loving a man, and yet so strong, but he faced a hard time congregation would be larger and then it'd be smaller because no matter what people would depart I've always said that none of us should depart except for the gospel we should never let anything get in the way unless it is clear in our minds we do not believe the gospel that we say we believe by the end of the first century the free spirit of preaching the gospel the liberty and worship Redemption and justification conditional on Christ alone. Righteousness earned, accepted, and imputed. All of this gave way to organization and hierarchy and conditional Christendom. And so when the Lord speaks to John about this congregation in Rome, two times he refers in this passage to the synagogue of Satan, the place of Satan. Church has become a place of Satan. But Jesus also said, As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. The Lord will not lose his people. If you're his, he will not lose you. He will not permit his people to depart from the truth. So we see both of these here. We see these two men, and you'll notice Never is it mentioned that just one man departs. One man always affects another. One person affects a family. One person affects another in the congregation. Never is it mentioned just one man departing. It's always one or more. But when he mentions Onesphorus, he speaks of his family singularly. I think an important thought for us to have. He will not permit his people to depart. Our urges, let us be urged from this passage to be among those who remain true to our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Father, bless your word to our hearts. Would you preserve us, cause us to persevere, Cause us to place our thoughts upon the Lord Jesus Christ and His merits. It's in His name we pray. Amen.